Uh, one of our listeners or viewers on Facebook, John, said they read one of your books recently. Posted a thought about it there on uh, on Facebook. I just read Gilstrap No Mercy. Very engaging. Thank you, Patricia McMillan. That was... You know, why don't we just change your name to Gil Strap? <laughs> because that's not a good name. <laughs> <laughs> it's short. It's to the point. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> you know, Gil, what do you make? Financial Phil, what do you think about just changing John Gilstrap's name to Gil Strap? I like it. See, <laughs> Phil likes it. <laughs> yeah, well, Steelers suck. Yeah. So <laughs> now you made Phil angry. Should have done that. No, Phil is such. Now. Phil is such Easy. a congenial, cooperative individual. He'll agree to most anything. <laughs> I kind of like. I'm agreeable. Phil's agreeable. I can't, I can't ride with this Steeler. This the Steeler stuff. We're in the off season. We're just starting the free agency market <laughs> with a new G, GM, and here you go throwing that out there. Come on, man. We're on our highway to seven. That's right, baby. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I, last week, the name for him was Mush. This week, it's Gil Strap. We'll get a new name for him every week. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, Phil, let's get right to it. We had a couple of bank failures over the weekend. If uh, you didn't pay attention to the news after you went home from work on Friday... Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank both failed. So, uh, Phil, can you tell us why, what you know about this scenario? Well, there's, there's a lot of arms to this and what it will mean to our stock markets. We yet don't, aren't quite sure. But you look at uh, uh, SVB Bank in particular, and I had a concentration of a few businesses, not a few businesses, but small tech startup companies, and as those have failed through last year, in a large part due to the the, the uh, tightening from our Federal Reserve as these tech companies failed, and that has kind of led to issues with SVB Bank. Now, what happened over the weekend, and it's important that everybody understand this, is that the government has basically stepped in. We can call it a bailout. I don't, I don't know that there's a better word for it, but it is different than 2008. And they said, hey, we're going to insure even those deposits over 250000 for all banks. So what they're trying to do is calm down this fear we have of our banking system. We're, we're trying to say, hey, this is a small bank, and I had a concentration of tech companies, and it wasn't the mom and pops or the people in Martinsburg, West Virginia, that had their twenty grand in there or whatever it may be. These are tech companies. And, and they're also insuring those deposits over, in large part, to, to make sure that payrolls are met. So if you were a company that had uh, your, your, your deposits there and you needed to make payrolls, we're saying, oh, well, hey, it's, wait a minute, this isn't Dexcom's fault, for example, is a, a company that had their monies there. This isn't Dexcom's fault. They still need to pay their employees. So we're going to ensure that they have the money to do so. And if you wanted to pull your money out, apparently when they open today, you're able to pull your money out. But they're trying to calm our fears by saying we will insure those deposits even over 250000 However, if you have equity in those companies, if you had bought stocks, you're not protected. So if they, if the SVB and Signature Bank and now like Regions Bank or something like that is struggling big time in overnight trading – but if you had stock in those companies, you're not protected at all. And that's always been the case with equity holders. You're not protected at all. So if you did have stock in those, you're not protected. You're, you're losing your money if you had those if you had those stocks, which, uh, by the way, some of those tech companies also had stock in SVB Bank. But they're looking back on the regulators. Did they not follow the regulations that were supposed to follow, so forth and so on? So there's a lot of fear. However... Now, we've been saying this for a long time, and we'll visit an old friend, which is the Federal Reserve, which we've yet to hear from in regards to this. But now it's an overwhelming belief that that half a percent increase that was probably going to happen next week is not going to happen now, that it may be zero. They may not do an increase at all. And that's going to put even more importance on the CPI and the PPI that's going to come out this week. What did that inflation look like? Can we justify no increase whatsoever or a temporary pause. So our markets are kind of going haywire trying to figure out how do we how do we deal with this. On one hand, fear, but on the other hand, hey, look, the Federal Reserve may slow down, and we know that that's what's been injuring our markets. So this is going to be an intermediate story, I think, not a short term, but an intermediate story. And but in large part, you know, we we've been saying over the last year, everything that is in, whether it's inflationary or disinflationary. 
it, that's what's going to drive our markets. And we're over in overnight trading. We see this big disparity between the Dow and the Nasdaq, which has also been pretty common of late. But because those financials lie, lay in the Dow, and there's fear with their banking system. But on the other hand, the Nasdaq that has more, uh, it's tied more to the movement of interest rates has done fairly well. So there's a lot of tentacles to this, and it's a lot of information. But over the weekend, what they tried to do is mom and pops of the world or just the average person. Calm down. If your money's in a small local bank, it should be okay. And Phil, while you were talking, the NASDAQ continued to drop <laughs> to the point where it basically is flat well, now. thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Dow futures are down eight-tenths, S&P six-tenths. The, the volatility in these indices since I got in this morning at 5 a.m. has been something to watch because the Dow has been the worst of the group. But at one point, it turned positive and started charging north. The S&P went up over more than a half percent. NASDAQ futures went up more than one percent. But that's now all completely gone and reversed into a, a negative uh, position for the Dow and the S&P futures by a good margin. And uh, NASDAQ has basically given up all of its gains and is flat. Why? Why, the, why so much volatility? That's a good question. But we don't, we don't know what to make of this yet. You know, in... It brings about fears from 2008 in the financial uh, collapse of 2008. And then you have others that come out. Goldman Sachs may say something. And then I've listened to this guy from Allianz about 30 times. I've never liked him. He, he's not, I've never been a big fan of his. But, uh, but he's been on CNBC all, all morning as well. And we may just be paying attention to what they think will happen but at the end of the day, we don't even know how to fully digest what has happened with this small bank. I know that it, it's something small, that it, it, and it brings us back to 2008, and it makes us afraid, and we start looking at our own deposits and our distrust of the government as a whole, and now we're saying, oh, another bailout. It's also important to know how they plan on bailing this out and how that may impact the Federal Reserve. So one of the, the – Janet Yellen had said, hey, look, this isn't going to be a taxpayer bailout. This is going to be a banking system bailout where they will have a special assessment against all banks in order to to cover these FDIC deposits for these that that SDB and Signature Bank that has failed. So if we're going to apply this special assessment, that's where this thought that the Federal Reserve can't increase rates again. So we're going to charge banks more money, and then in order to meet their overnight deposits, banks borrow money at the Fed fund rate. So if they're going to borrow money, can we get, can continue to jack up rates? We're just putting more pressure on the banking system as a whole, and that is seen as disinflationary. And if that's disinflationary, then Federal Reserve doesn't have to increase the rates. And the Federal Reserve doesn't have to increase the rates, and the NASDAQ can do well. Or wait a minute, or maybe they, maybe other banks will fail due to this, and then we're looking at 2008 again. So we're, we're all over the place with this, with this small bank. But it's important to know that, SVB had a concentrated business. They were making loans to tech startup companies. I actually listened to one of their clients this morning, and they wanted to go with J.P. Morgan or Bank of America. But because they were a startup, they couldn't get the money from them, so they go to Silicon Valley Bank, and they get their loan from there. And one of their criteria was if you're going to get your loan from us, you have to have all your deposits with us. That's fairly common. Now, they have paid off their loans, and they're able to pull their money out so there's this big rush to big banks. The, the federal government is trying to prevent people from doing that. We want to support these small, regional, or local banks, so we don't want that to happen. That's why they came out and said, hey, we're going to insure all deposits so people aren't pulling their money from the small local banks and depositing them into the bigger banks to make sure that the entire banking system is okay. Yeah, I think I read $42 billion in withdrawals. At uh, SVB, Bill. Yeah, uh, Phil. A couple of questions. The uh, uh, first one was the communality between Signature and SVB. Uh, is that their small regional banks? Is that the com only communality? I think so. You know, I don't know because SVB has gotten the majority of the attention. So I'm not sure what kind of businesses Signature Bank supported and, and what was the cause for their fail. Right now, what I know about is Silicon Valley. And that name tells you all you need to know. And they have been uh, the ones. Phil, sig signature Phil was crypto. That was their concentration. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> crypto, so, crypto, which seems to, last I heard anyway, was doing well this morning. I can't figure that one out. Yeah. So, but, the, um, but because of those concentrations, now when you look at the bigger banks, the JP Morgans and the 
and I'm talking about banks, not investment firms, but banks, J.P. Morgan's and, and probably even truest of the world, they, they have a, a more diverse portfolio of businesses instead of one sector failing and then, uh-oh, look what's happening to us because the sector's failing. Well, the two examples we've used this morning look like they uh, they were they, their vulnerability was somewhat restricted. Uh, that brings to mind is the is the Fed overreacting uh, since there's only a couple so banks that have uh, uh, that on the verge of uh, a bankruptcy uh, or closing. I don't think so. I think they're trying to they're tamper down everyone's fear because of what happened in 2008. So they don't want an overreaching fear in people pulling their money out of all banks, especially those larger deposits. We have to remember we got the FDIC insurance on any account under or 250 or under or ownership of 250 and under and of course families can have it bigger because of different uh, types of ownerships but what they don't want is those with those huge large deposits pulling their money out especially of the local banks where the smaller regional banks where it would have more of an impact that's why they did that so i don't know that i don't think it's necessarily overreaching they're just trying to tamper down our fear some do we think that the SVB failure was in the works for a long time, kind of has been bleeding for a long time, and we haven't noticed it, and then it just tipped over? Or was this a classic panic where there was a run well, on the bank and, and they had and they closed? That's a good question, and that's what they're trying to figure out where regulators should have picked this up. So someone went back to their last stockholder meeting and those forward-looking statements that we point to, and I think it was two months ago, and how – bullish SBB was on their on their profitability and the health of their bank and they were very bullish on it and it was heck Jim Cramer gave them a buy sign like, like two weeks ago he was encouraging people to purchase that as a stock so everything on their balance sheet and their forward-looking statements brings to question who should have seen this well, shouldn't we have noticed this earlier and then scrutiny on on regulators and speaking of scrutiny, they just had um, executive payouts that apparently was scheduled. I'm sure they're going to have to give this money back. But they had executive payouts. There were stock sales from executives that just happened last week, and then all of a sudden they fell. Now, they were supposedly scheduled, but still, at the end of the day, they have an equity position in that. And they, there, there's going to be claims that you should have known this. It didn't just, you just didn't wake up Friday morning and think, uh-oh, everybody pulled their money out all at once. So they probably did see that coming, and there's going to be scrutinization on that as well. Do we worry that there's a systemic thing happening that we haven't found yet? It, it, it seems to me it's been a long time since we've heard reports of bank failures, and then to have two over the course of, what, three yeah. days. It is, I don't believe yeah. in coincidences, and isn't that kind of scary? Yes, it is, and that's why the, they, they had come out and said, hey, we will insure deposits even over 250000 So you basically have a, a government guarantee that your money is safe regardless of where it's at. It's insured by the government, so take, take heed, you're okay, everything's going to be all right. And they're trying to keep that fear down. So that's why they did that over the weekend. Yeah, but that can be aspirin on an arterial bleed, right? I mean, we've already pumped trillions of dollars into the economy, and now we're going to spend billions of dollars to bail out banks. And, and well, I, I worry that, that we're not looking or we haven't found some financial cancer that, that needs to be uncovered. Well, and, and that's, that's where, because of that, that's why they've also said this isn't going to be. Now, I would argue that, and I'm like you, I would argue that if they say, well, look, we're going to apply a special assessment on banks. And if you apply a special assessment on banks, we know what's going to happen. Their, their fees will go up eventually. Their fees are going to go up. Their loans are going to go down, or, or how many loans they put out, or they'll be more restrictive. Um, they, so all they'll pay less interest. All of those things will filter its way down through us, even if it's not by way of taxes or, or, or a pool of money that they're using from taxes to pay it off. So that's why I'm okay with calling it a bailout, but they're saying, hey, this isn't a bailout, this isn't the same thing. We're going to apply a special assessment over on the overall banking industry, and I'm not quite sure that it still doesn't make its way down to us that use the banks. But overall, what what they are trying to do is calm those fears, and it may not work. You know, there's a lot of untrusting people of the government, so they're going to say, I don't care what the government says, I don't trust it, and I'm pulling my money out. And that's what we need to find out over these next couple of days. Will they be more failures? Is this a issue 
And ultimately, you know, there's a lot of argument that the, the increase in rates over, over the last year or so has brought this on. And that's why another reason why people are starting to think, hey, the Federal Reserve is not going to do anything, or if anything, it will only be a quarter of a percent, not half a percent, because now we're starting to see the impacts of those rate increases from last year. And, and Phil, it's, sorry, Bill, i got to jump in because this is keeping on the theme of what Phil just said. Both Silvergate and SVB, remember Silvergate, we didn't talk too much about this at all last week. Silvergate Capital uh, collapsed last week, uh, the precursor to Silicon Valley Bank and then Signature Bank going under. But Silvergate and SVB both put their money into U.S. Treasuries, which, of course, lost value as the Federal Reserve raised their interest rates. And this would be a good time, if you could, Phil, link uh, how the value of a bond moves with the yield that uh, as, as, the, as the yield increases and the bond value decreases. That would seem counterintuitive to many people who don't know the relationship. Well, and, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible without my little whiteboard to draw on. But if you uh, any bond issuance can be sold on the secondary market, right? So if you purchased a bond, if you said, hey, I'm going to purchase Phil's Lemonade Stand, I always use the Lemonade Stand. Phil's Lemonade Stand wants to expand their business, and they want to uh, put a Lemonade Stand on every corner in Berkeley County, but we need money to do that. So I'm going to issue a bond, and people said, man, I love his Lemonade. I'm going to buy those bonds. I know he'll pay me back. But at the time, those interest rates were 2%. Well, now that the Federal Reserve has pushed interest rates up, if I would have bought that bond that's going to pay me out in 10, 20, 30 years, if I would have bought that bond and I need now I need my cash, I need my capital, I want to go sell that bond, well, that purchaser of that bond would say to me, I'm not buying your 2% bond for the 10000 you're going to pay me or 20 or whatever when it matures because I can go get another bond for 4%. So, therefore that value of that bond has gone down. So when people have to sell those bonds to meet requirements or, or meet their needs or pay out people or depositors that are pulling their money out, they have lost money. And that is what some of these smaller banks have dealt with. And there's that concentration of small tech companies that were pulling money out or wasn't meeting their requirements, or paying their bills and so forth, and the bank had to – call in some of those bonds or cash out some of those bonds that were treasuries that were at much lower rates than what you can get now. So therefore, the current market value is much lower. That's the inverse relationship between the secondary market price of bonds and the movement of interest rates. As interest rates go down, existing bond value, or interest rates go up, I should say, existing bond values go down. So here you're thinking you're doing a safe thing by buying government treasuries and ultimately it helped result in their liquidation. Yeah. Right, Phil, recently there's been some talk about relaxing some of the regulations that were imposed in 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, did will these failures have anything to do with relaxing the regulations, or is that something that may impact the future discussion of relaxation of, of regulations? I, I would imagine, because there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on those regulations that said, hey, why didn't we pick this up? So I would imagine, and we don't know yet, but I would imagine that they would, if anything, strengthen regulations to ensure that this doesn't happen on a much larger scale in all local or regional banks, or God forbid the banks that we have coined too large to fail or too big to fail. That's what those regulations are supposed to prevent. So if there was a discussion to, hey, let's relax some of these regulations on banks and to allow them to be more profitable or, or have varying degrees of, of loan issuances and so forth as, as far as what credit they accept, I would imagine those would get tightened. But there's no indication that they had, they had weakened uh, regulations and the uh, weakened regulation no. contributed to these figures. This, no. looks, this looks to be pretty cut and dried. They bought a lot of Treasury bonds and... Uh, which, I don't know how long ago those were purchased, Phil, but we've been talking about increasing interest rates for a couple of years now. Quite some time. Yeah, quite some time. So I'm not sure who was and in I, charge I of their the, investment department, but shouldn't they have been able to tell this? Well, I guess the unexpected risk because of their concentration in small tech startups, that as those companies failed and removed the money, and then they had to produce that money and sold bonds, they didn't foresee that uh, those uh, people were drawing their money all at once or, or a bunch at a time. You know, there's a lot of systems that can't afford 
to have people do everything all at once. Think of Social Security or a pension plan. They can't afford everybody to retire at once. They just don't have the funds for it. They need that spread out, and banks aren't much different. If everybody goes and pulls their money out and they got to create the cash, there go your, your risk and your problem that, that you have and their concentration in one sector, business sector, that, that, that was their problem. Dow futures are now down 1.3%, S&P 1.4%, NASDAQ futures 1.1%. Phil, this stuff's dropping like a, a rock now. And uh, for whatever reason, Bitcoin is up 4.5%, Ethereum 2 and 3 quarters percent, Litecoin is up 4%. So I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it myself, but that's what's happening right now. Either. So, yeah, I don't either. I don't know what's happened over the last 25 minutes that we've been on the phone, but I know one thing in period of uncertainty, probably the last place I'm going to put my money is in, in cryptocurrency. Yeah, but everyone's locking to it this morning. Yeah. I mean, you can't, they can't buy it fast enough right now. What this says, <laughs> Phil, is you have a lot more influence than what you think you have. <laughs> yeah, there's too, there's too many people listening to this show, apparently. <laughs> Financial Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Philip, have a great day. You guys do the same.